Good afternoon and welcome to the Space Lab Speaker Series. My name is Alicia Tropak and I'm the Director of Transformation for ACO, and I will be your moderator today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories and original caretakers of the land where we make our living and enjoy the abundance of the land with our friends and family. I am honored to live and work in Treaty 7. The traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Nitsi Dabi, comprised of the Siksika, Kainai, Bigani nations, the Satina nations, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, the Bears Paw, Wesley First Nations, the city of Calgary, Mokinsis, is also the home to Metis Nation, Region 3. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present in the communities and regions where we operate. This lecture is the fourth lecture in the ACO speaker series. These lectures are a chance for us to share knowledge and insights with, from thought leaders, providing our ACO colleagues and ACO's network of peers, partners, and friends with information on promising developments, trends, and leadership in exciting and relevant fields. We previously heard from Dr. Shi from the University of Alberta in August. In case you missed it, please visit ACO's YouTube channel for a recording of the lecture. Our next lecture will be with Dr. Misha Kirchhoff from the University of Arizona on November 7th. Before we get underway with today's lecture, I would also like to remind our online audience that this session is a one-way video and audio format. Please ask questions by using the question icon on the right of your screen. We will open up question functionality roughly halfway through the lecture. To our in-person in audience, if you have a question, please raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself, and ask your question directly to Dr. Holroyd Duke. Now, I would like to introduce Andrea Klaver Langen, Vice President of Transformation, who will have some uh, welcoming remarks and will introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Alicia. Um, and welcome everyone here in person. This is really exciting because this is the first time in the At Home Space Lab speaker series that we have had a hybrid audience. So it's really nice to see some people here. And uh, we'd encourage folks who are in the Calgary area to come and join us in person next time around. I want to, first of all, just reflect on my role in reconciliation. Um, and I want to myself recognize the various traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands on which ATCO supports communities and customers. And I'd like to offer each of us an opportunity to do the same today, no matter where you're attending with us from. I reaffirm my commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to improve my own understanding of Indigenous people and their cultures. As I said, we're very pleased to have you here today for our ACO Space Lab speaker series. These sessions are a chance for all of us to engage and learn and share knowledge with thought leaders who truly inspire. In addition to presenting this speaker series, our, the transformation team at ATCO leads ATCO Space Lab. Space Lab is an enterprise-wide framework of collaborative support for the creative energy for our colleagues. It's a source of funding, expertise, and in particular expertise for any ATCO colleague who wants to test and achieve sustainable new value for ATCO and for our customers. And we have supported the achievements of over 110 project teams since 2019. Today, we are joined by Dr. Holroyd Leduc, who will tell us about new assistive, assistive technologies, personalized care, and adaptive environments, and how they can dramatically improve the quality of life for elderly Albertans in continuing care. And I know that this is a topic that is near and dear to every one of us. Dana, Dr. Holroyd Leduc, is an academic geriatrician, and she was just telling me one of only 300 in Canada and she is the head of the Department of Medicine at the University of Calgary. She completed her residency in internal medicine and geriatric medicine at the University of Toronto before completing a research fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco through the VA Quality Scholars Program. The primary focus of Dr. Holroyd Leduc's knowledge 
research is knowledge translation aimed at improving the quality of life and care provided to older adults. The issues, trends, systems, and innovations relating to an aging population in Canada are of particular interest to ATCO, and we recently completed some work with the Institute for Community Prosperity at Mount Royal University that led to the publishing of a publicly available document titled Aging and Thriving in the 21st, 21st Century. Um, and I don't know if it's possible to put up a link to that anywhere, but if we can, we will do that so that you can look at that document. It is my safe pleasure to welcome you here today, Dr. Holroyd LeDuc. We're very excited to hear you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to share today uh, a project that I'm uh, leading at the University of Calgary entitled uh, Rethinking Continuing Care. In particular, I'm going to talk about um, our thoughts around how do we use environmental design and assistive technology to actually improve the new care environment. So first off, um, my only conflict of interest is I'm now the academic lead of the University of Calgary Brenda Stratford Center on Aging, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is and, and the uh, role this center will be playing in this project. And then I'm going to try throughout to use person first and inclusive language um, throughout the presentation. But if you find any areas that you think I can improve, please don't hesitate to reach out. Sorry. All right, so I think most of you um, saw during the COVID pandemic that um, particularly during the first wave or the, at the start of the pandemic, um, it really highlighted some of the chronic issues within the Canadian continuing care um, landscape right across the country, including in Alberta, and really highlighted that we need to really work to address this, particularly as the population continues to age. So particularly it highlighted the need for more research within the continuing care context that's focused on frailty and focused on engaging residents and family members in the research so we can truly come up with designs um, that will work in this setting. So we know there's been systemic failures to deal with the consequences of our population trends, and this include um, our, our Canadian population is aging and aging rapidly. The, with this, the prevalence of dementia and cognitive impairment is also increasing. And then, unfortunately, at the same time, family caregivers of older adults are actually decreasing as families become more spread out and we don't have the same kind of uh, family uh, makeup that we used to have in terms of multiple generations living in close proximity to each other. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Canadian population and why I say it's rapidly aging. So and this may not be that um, unfamiliar to most of you, but the proportion of that those over 65 is rapidly increasing in Canada. And actually the fastest growing population is those over 85. And you'll see from this figure here, um, it's showing uh, historical and some projected data in terms of what's happening to the uh, population uh, as time goes on. So the top line, that's the sort of the diamonds that's clear, that's people between 15 and 65. So you can see for the most part relatively flat or they'll maybe decreasing a bit. But the surprising thing is the bottom two lines. So you can see the black circles, that's the Canadian population that's under 15. And then the, the gray triangles, that's the population that's over 65. And you can see that in about uh, 2015, those, um, those lines um, intersected. And now our population actually above 65 outnumbers um, that below 15, for, I think for the first time in the history of Canada. And it's continuing, you can see the continuing to, to diverge, but until about at least 2051. And by 2030, 2035, one in four Canadians is actually going to be over 65. Because some people say in Alberta, population is younger. That is true, but still in Alberta, it's going to be about one in five Albertans within by about 2030 will be over 65. Partially, um, it's because our life expectancy in Canada is is actually quite high. And this is in part due to our high standard of living and our, our excellent healthcare system. So we have the seventh uh, highest uh, life expectancy in the world. Our average life expectancy is almost 83 years. 
uh, women still live slightly longer than men. So um, the average life expectancy in, in men is about 81. In women, it's just under 85. The top five causes of death um, haven't changed significantly with one exception. So coronary artery disease is still the number one um, cause of death amongst Canadians. Although number two, it's now Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So the prevalence of dementia as we age goes up. Right? So as our population ages, we're gonna see more cognitive impairment, more dementia, and there'll be more deaths from, from dementia. Basically, once you're over the age of 80, 85, about 20% of that population will develop some degree of cognitive impairment, not uncommon as we age. The other causes of death, I think if sort of people would be not surprised about, which still lung cancer is a, is a uh, leading cause of death, as is lung disease, such as COPD. And then um, the fifth is, is stroke. So what about dementia and aging? So as I said, about, so about 7% of those over 65 are currently living with um, dementia, which is just under half a million Canadians in as of 2017. About two thirds of them are women, partly because women live longer, partly because um, there is probably a component of just um, being female that increases your risk. The risk of dementia doubles for every five year increase in age between the age of 65 and, and 84. So what this means is that the annual healthcare cost for Canadians for dementia is not small. In 2011, it was over 8.3 billion. And so this is a combination of di uh, direct healthcare costs that um, provided by the healthcare system, but also a lot of indirect costs that families are picking up and family caregivers. It's projected that by 2031, the costs of uh, caring for individuals with dementia is going to actually uh, be more than 16 billion, so more than double from what it was. Uh, so we have some great successes with modern medicine, but there's also some consequences of modern medicine as, as our population ages. So life expectancy of persons diagnosed with many common diseases over the last 50 plus years has increased. However, they, we haven't actually cured that many diseases. So what we have done is we've taken a lot of acute diseases that used to kill people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and changed them into chronic diseases where people actually live with them and live with them for um, sometimes decades. So what's happening is we actually are increasing the ongo ongoing associated morbidity associated with um, these diseases. So for example, cardiovascular disease, COPD, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, cancer, and even HIV has been turned into a chronic people are living. Um, three, four decades with it, with it. As a result, the prevalence of frailty is actually increasing in our population. So first off, just looking at the frequency of chronic conditions um, with aging and the fact that we do tend to accumulate them. This like, diagram, I think, clearly illustrates that. You can see that if we look at those between 18 and 24, only a small percentage of people are actually living with um, one or more chronic diseases. By the time we reach 65 and over, seven, almost 75% of the population is living with at least one chronic disease. If we look at sort of 11 of the most chronic um, conditions uh, experienced by Canadians. And then you can see in the, in the further diagram, it's further divided. And as we age by the time we reach 85 or over, over 80% of people are living with at least one chronic condition and many living with multiple chronic conditions. And remember, as I said, our average life expectancy is close to, to 85, which means a lot of the population as we age is living with chronic conditions. So I mentioned that frailty is increasing, and so I want to make sure we're all clear on what, what I mean when I say frailty. So what frailty is, is a state of increased vulnerability to adverse health outcomes compared to other people of the same age. So we compare an 80-year-old with another 80-year-old, 20-year-old with another 20-year-old. Anybody can be frail at any point in their life, although the prevalence of frailty does tend to increase as we age. It results from a reduced um, physiological reserve, and it reduces our ability to cope with normal or even minor health stresses. It's associated with an increased risk of physical, cognitive, and functional decline, as well as an increased utilization of healthcare resources. So frailty is becoming increasingly common with advancing age, and frailty itself, more than age, is a driver of health status and a driver of healthcare use. So the diagram here shows the prevalence of frailty in, in Canada by age. And you can see that almost 25% of Canadians over 65 are frail, which also means that 75% are not frail and are living quite well um, and robustly in the community. 
As we get older, by the time we reach 85 or older, about 50% of the population is living with some degree of frailty. And think about frailty on a continuum. So right from being very robust to being end of life. And so people can have variable components of frailty. Um, you can you can define it as um, sort of dichotomously as you're frail or not frail, but for the most part, people have varying degrees with some being significantly frail and others being minor, mildly frail. So if we think about uh, continuing care uh, context, frailty is um, really one of the driving factors of why older adults end up in continuing care. So about a third of Canadians over 85 or about 150,000 Canadians live in continuing care currently. And it's projected as our population ages that we're gonna need another 200,000 new beds by 2035. Long-term care residents as a population are frail with functional and cognitive impairments. So they're needing help with their basic activities of daily living. They usually have complex health um, and care needs. A, a large number of them are experiencing cognitive impairment or dementia. They are nearing the end of life. So we know that in Western Canada, looking at data around the long-term care sector in particular, which is the highest end of the continuing care sector, that the life expectancy in long-term care currently in Western Canada is about 18 months. There's a high prevalence of burnsome symptoms as these people are advancing the, um, near the end of life, including pain, as well as dementia-related responsive behaviors. So why do we need to rethink continuing care now? It's because continuing care is challenged on many levels. There's a lot of environmental and human resources issues that we need to optimize. Care delivery innovations are needed to optimize quality of care and quality of life. And I think this is well highlighted in a lot of the media coverage um, that happened in continuing care. And people were shocked that this was happening in continuing care. But I can tell you, having been involved in this sector, that there's been concerns around the continuing care sector for decades. It just wasn't particularly well known to society. We tend to be a society that is a bit ageist and we tend not to focus on this population, um, thinking that the, you know their societal worth really isn't um, as high as, as others in society. So there's really been this huge gap in investment in architectural and technological advances in the continuing care sectors. We have spent time and energy looking at smart hospital units. So here in Calgary, the South South Campus, a lot of effort went into looking at human factors design when it was designed. There's a human factors lab and a uh, sort of uh, this is called the ward of the 21st century at the Fairhills Hospital, where they've been looking at innovative hospital designs for decades. As well, there's been a lot of work looking at smart homes. How can we make homes smarter? How can people age in place? Which I think is all needed. But unfortunately, this has overshadowed opportunities for technological advancement in the continuing care sector. So the research question that we're hoping to address with the project that I'm going to present to you, and I'm going to give you some high level of some of the initiatives that we're hoping to do over the coming um, decade. But basically the overall question is we want to answer, how can the health of a rapidly aging Canadian population residing in continuing care be improved through innovations that focus on the environment, the way we interact with the environment, and how they, we interact with each other? So we're talking about taking technology and environmental design in the context of how actually people live and work in continuing care. So the exciting thing is um, that the Rethinking Continuing Care project is actually gonna happen right in um, a continuing care facility. So uh, Cambridge Manor opened up in the university district during the pandemic, and they have actually, one of their units, they've assigned it to be what's called the Continuing Care Unit of the Future. There's 34 resident uh, rooms in this wing. It's designed to support research and innovation. So ideally they're gonna make two test bed units where the plan is to actually um, demolish four uh, of these resident rooms and turn them into two um, resident rooms that uh, have capacity to actually do some real time testing. So there'd be like an AV type testing unit um, pending, pending funding, funding to do that. When they built it, they added additional wiring support to support research. There's also outdoor recreational structures around the facility. There's an inner courtyard. There's also facilities uh, or space around um, the facility to, to actually test outdoor recreational structures. And then we put in a qualitative lab where we can actually do real time focus groups and interviews um, on site with the continued care residents, with the family members and with the people that work there um, as, as we're doing studies um, and doing the evaluation. Lots of end user involvement. By end users, I mean the residents that live there, their family members, as well as the people that are working there. 
And then this, all these activities will be supported by the on-site um, University of Calgary Brandon Stratford Centre on Aging. So the Centre on Aging is now actually physically located in Cambridge Manor. We have our office spaces there. This facility is convenient proximity to the university, both the main campus as well as the health sciences campus. It's um, located down by the foothills. Uh, it's able to support aging in place in that it's connected with an independent seniors con condo called um, Maple. So it's, Maple is right beside it. You can walk across the street or even um, do a plus 15. Uh, we've Brenda Stratford has actually purchased a condo in Maple, so we can actually do some real time testing of this condo of some of the technologies that we'll be testing in continuing care to also see about their usability in an independent seniors um, setting. And then the interesting thing about Cambridge Manor, it actually has different levels of care. So the residents um, have varying degrees of dependency in their activities of daily living. So we'll be able to test various um, technologies and various built in designs for people that are, have varying levels of care needs. So basically what we're proposing to do is to build an experiential ecosystem for innovation that's located within this operational continuing care facility that will be connected, that is connected with an independent living facility. So it's going to allow us to study the optimization of the lived environment for those with frailty and with multiple morbidities. We'll be able to focus on innovation, research, and research um, capacity building within continuing care. Um, obviously, research capacity is needed because this is not a, a traditional area where we've done a lot of research in. It'll also allow us to rethink regulatory environment and industry standards within continuing care for design and manufacturing. So a lot of the design um, elements. So I'm not an architect, but we've been working closely with the um, School of Architecture. A lot of the design elements now, when you build a continuing care structure, is actually based on outdated design elements that actually were not necessarily built um, or considering the frail older population. It was more of a younger sort of post-war um, vet who had disability. That's where a lot of our um, accessibility designs are for that population, which their needs are different than frailer um, population that is predominantly women, not men. So we need to we need to actually rethink some of our design and some of our design standards. So this gives us an opportunity to do that. And then it also gives us the actually the opportunity to study the impacts of these innovations directly on the residents and the workforce's well-being, their experience and their outcomes, and actually give them an opportunity to fully participate in the research and then uh, just help us help us spread and disseminate the results. So the, the rethinking continued care is going to have three main themes and research objectives and some we've already started moving on others will have to wait additional funding so the three themes the first one is optimizing the continuing care environment so the objective here is that we want to design and iteratively evaluate innovative architectural features and architectural and industry design product innovations that are really focused on optimizing the physical nature of living and, and working both indoor and outdoor environment within continuing care our second theme is about optimizing functional capabilities. So residents in continuing care have functional limitations and we want to try to help them maintain their independence as much as possible. So the objective here would be to apply and study technological innovations focused on evaluating and optimizing both the physiologic and the psychosocial aspects of aging within continuing care. And then our third is focusing on optimizing workforce and resident experience. So specifically, we want to develop and evaluate innovative models of care and professional practice in concert with um, technology in order to optimally deliver care for residents within continuing care, while at the same time thinking about the work in. So those that work in continuing care tend to be women, it's 90% women, they're often racialized women, they're often um, newcomers to Canada. And so it's a population that's typically been underfunded and under supported and not given the same opportunities for uh, educational advancement and to really um, learn on site and, and be well supported. So part of the theme three will be to look at that and to actually make a work workforce um, in working environment that actually is conducive, which ultimately will improve the care that's being provided to the residents that live. This is where people live, the um, older, older adults, this is their homes. So this team, um, we have global leadership, so I'm leading this project, but there's three um, or actually four uh, leads at one, one, uh, one to two for each of the themes. So the first theme around the environmental design is going to be led by Dr. John Brown, who's the Dean of our School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at the University of Calgary. So he is 
an architecture, award-winning architecture, who actually has done a lot around looking at the built environment, particularly the built environment um, in the community. And so he would be leading, looking at redesigning the continuing care uh, environment. Theme two around functional capability will be led by Dr. Mark Poulin, who's a professor and the Brenda Strafford Foundation Chair in Alzheimer's Research, who's done doing a lot of work looking at exercise and sleep and the impact on um, aging and the aging brain. And then theme three about around optimizing the workforce is going to be led by Dr. Lorraine Venturata, who is a professor professor and a previous chair in gerontology. So she's in the faculty of nursing and is a nurse herself by training. And then Dr. Zara Gadarzi, who's a geriatrician and assistant professor in medicine. So we have a pretty um, diverse team leading um, our projects. And then I'm just gonna show an overview of how many people are involved in this project. So we have over eight faculties um, at the University of Calgary involved. So we have not only um, the School of Architecture Planning um, and Landscaping, as well as the Cummings School of Medicine, but we have nursing and we have um, the biomedical engineering group, so engineering, um, as well as uh, social workers and social workers involved, kinesiology, law, and I'll um, talk a bit about, about some of the aspects around law. And then we have collaborators from um, Mount Royal University, as well as um, other universities in Alberta and across the country, as well as some collaborators um, in Europe and Australia. So the first theme around optimizing the continuing care environment. So as I already mentioned, part of this is thinking environmental design or redesign, right? So it's not just about building all new facilities, although we do need to build more facilities. It's also about how do we redesign the ones we currently have. So the idea is what with when we get enough funding, we do plan to develop these A-B test bed um, units where we can actually um, test iteratively, design and iteratively evaluate innovative architectural features. So this will be done using equipment that's already in place in, in the SAFL lab. Um, so they, they have a lab down downtown Calgary where they can do a lot of fabrication and, and building design. And then also as part of this proposal, um, they have a mobile fabrication lab that they're putting together so they can actually move anything they fabricate in their in their main lab. They can move to on site and then they can also do some fabrication on site at Cambridge Manor to actually look at, you know, changing it in real time architectural features and evaluating them sort of using it instead of this AV concept and actually get people living uh, in these suites to actually evaluate that does this work and what works about it and they can make modifications and, and continue to Look at, look at the design. So we'll be able to develop architectural and ind industrial design products and innovations in real time. And we'll also be able to drive needed updates to guidelines for configuring resident rooms and the continuing care facilities. So remember, this is where this is people's homes. It's not like um, a, an acute care hospital where you transiently go in and then you go home. We need to be designing continuing care facilities, recognizing that, that these are people's homes, that these people need um, a lot more care and, and medical attention. So we have to be thinking about how can we innovatively design a home environment that also meets their medical needs. The other thing this can lead to is a commercialization and patents of new architectural and industrial design innovations. So a very unique concept, nowhere else in Canada, or actually from our, our environmental scan, nowhere else in the world that we know of where there's this close um, relationship between architects and, and medicine to look at developing real time um, evaluations. So this is a really novel concept that we're hoping um, to advance and, and do work on over the coming decade. Similarly, we want to look at outdoor spaces. So I think the pandemic highlighted this as well, um, that you know, we needed opportunities to be able to get out and enjoy outdoor spaces, particularly you know, at times where people were um, having to be socially isolated from family members and from the outside world. So part of this project and we're moving forward with in the spring is we're actually going to buy gym equipment that actually is designed for an older adults that are frail to, to use and to test. They're buying, we're buying some tri-shaw bikes, which are um, usable by older adults um, with frailty, and then also going to use gardening resources. And we have two of our researchers um, on the team, um, Dr. Dal Seitz, who's a judge of psychiatrist, and then uh, Sonia Yakovic from MRU are doing a lot of research looking at the outdoor spaces, um, particularly for individuals with cognitive impairment and how can how can outdoor spaces be used um, sort of in a therapeutic way? So we want to be able to advance therapeutic design principles, as well as understand how these activities improve residents' physical, cognitive, and mental health. 
If we move to the second theme, which is around optimizing functional capabilities, some of the exciting things in that we're actually starting on already is we're looking at robotic pets. I'm not sure if anybody have seen the robotic pets, the, the robotic kittens and puppies that people have, where they actually um, will respond and meow and move and or bark in response to people um, touching them or, or interacting with them. So they, this technology around robotic pets has actually become quite affordable. You can get a robotic pet for a few hundred dollars. Um, but we don't really understand their role, right? We haven't evaluated them really, particularly in the continuing care context. How how could we best use them and do the, what what you know? Do they have um, impact in terms of increasing physical and also social engagement? So we have a study ongoing. We've actually purchased some robotic kit kittens and and puppies using um, a chair that I'm fortunate to have. I have a, a chair at the University um, in Geriatric Medicine that's funded by the Bernd Stratford Foundation. And we've purchased um, these kittens and puppies and are. are are testing them actually in the real real time. The rec therapists within continuum care are actually um, working with our researchers and we're doing a bit of a qualitative design to figure out how do they use them and what impact are they having. We also ultimately want to, there's a, also a, a robotic animal that you can actually walk, the dog you can walk, which is not available yet in Canada, but we're hoping it will become available so we can actually test that to test uh, you know, walking a robotic pet in terms of physical activity. Um, which you can imagine the appeal to this, right? Robotic pets overcome a lot of the barriers of having real, not that we shouldn't also be thinking about real animals in the basis, but sometimes there's barriers um, to that that robotic pets can maybe um, overcome. Learning a lot about how people interact with these, um, these robotic animals. Also, another project that we're moving forward is using virtual reality in the, in the continuing care context, for specifically, um, Dr. Uh, Linda Leggard um, Duffett, who's a nurse that um, also works within um, biomedical engineering, is exploring the role of virtual reality and supporting something called reminiscence therapy. And this is for residents who are living with dementia. So what reminiscence therapy is, is you um, use various um, techniques to have them recall past positive memories, and it helps them get a sense of value and belonging as their, as their own failing them. The idea is to, to use, how can we use virtual reality, so virtual reality goggles and that, and virtual reality environments to actually um, use reminiscence therapy to quality of life. So she's got a, we've helped purchase, through my chair, we've helped purchase the equipment and, and she's moving forward with the study um, right in, in continuing care. Other things that we're hoping to do in the, in the coming um, years is use something called positive technology. And so this is our, um, so our uh, faculty of engineering is actually leaders in this area and have um, sort of unique labs that they've developed, but want to sort of take this technology and study it in the continued care context. So basically, it's technology that's designed to support well-being. It's um, we want to study passive monitoring and use it to predict and prevent adverse events such as falls in older adults in continued care. But the technology also helps protect individuals' privacy. So it's biometric enabled detection, classification, and prediction of behavior patterns that actually where we can monitor individuals' actions using um, depth-based privacy protecting um, imaging. So it's like looking at uh, the scale, the muscle, the skeletal um, using um, this depth-based technology where you can't actually identify the individual, but you can um, pick up patterns and use real time and use um, use um, instruments to actually predict um, when somebody might and prevent um, from having an adverse event in this context. We're also going to look at, um, so we have a really well established um, lab um, within the Faculty of Kinesiology and Family School Medicine led by um, Dr. Mark Lamb, where he's actually looking at exercise and the impact of exercise on sleep and the impact of exercise and sleep on the aging brain. So what we're proposing is actually doing some of these studies within the continued continue care context. So we actually we're going to look to purchase an adaptive recumbent virtual reality bicycle so people can bike if they're anywhere in the world, but they're actually um, in the care setting. And then also um, looking at walking on a treadmill or gate mat system to actually encourage physical activity um, and then explore the impacts this is having on the aging brain, on cardiovascular health, and also on sleep patterns. So we'll be exploring um, uh, wearable technologies within this population, both for this project around um, looking at the impact of exercise and, and others. So there's there's quite um, a group within engineering um, being led by Reed Fer Dr. Reed Ferber that's looking at wearable technology um, in um, the community and, and plans to look at this in this context as well. 
So for our last theme around optimizing workforce and resident experiences, we basically want to combine technologies with clinical practice in innovative ways. The one innovation which um, Dr. Leonard Duffett is actually going to lead in, we've actually just purchased this equipment, so we're going to start looking at this, is preventing um, health healthcare workforce back injuries. So what, back injuries in the healthcare workforce, particularly continuing care, is very high. It costs Canadians, um, the Canadian system billions of dollars in workers' compensation claims and actually is quite disabling. Um, and you, you can imagine, right, when you're talking to a population with it needing care needs, they need help with, with transfers and with mobility and, it, and if you don't, um, are careful they result in healthcare work with back injuries so amongst nurses and, and nurses and healthcare aides in particular. So what she's proposing to do is actually collect bio, biometric data to develop predictive models in terms of what kinds of um, activities actually predict your risk of having a back, in, back injury and then using this technology to actually change how people um, actually do their, do their work and sort of prevent um, a very active way to prevent back injuries. So it's using artificial intelligence and for real-time feedback to the users um, so that they um, change how they actually um, do their day-to-day -day work and prevent them from um, injuring their back. We're also going to look at implementing and evaluating innovative evidence-informed care pathways, um, which basically take evidence, take literature. So we typically we've done we've done a few of these already. Um, so what we do is we look at what's the evidence out there, um, synthesize it down, do systematic reviews, use these to develop tools and pathways and focusing on things like improving quality of life, symptom management, functional status, and then implement them using implementation science research to actually change day-to-day -day practice. Um, so working with um, the frontline workers to actually, what are the barriers to, to, to this practice change? How can we get rid of the barriers so that they can actually implement these new ways of practice? Measure how the impacts they have on, on so We already have a project underway where we're looking at a frailty pathway where we're actually implementing in the, the continuing care unit of the future and, and we'll be spreading it. We're actually going to look at picking up frailty um, earlier, um, you know, upon admission to continued care, what, you know, how frail is somebody, what would be an appropriate care pathway based on their level of frailty, and then uh, have strategies to actually make sure that their, their care plan actually addresses that to optimize their function and ideally um, decrease the rate of continuing to become more and more frail. So ultimately improving their quality of life and as I said, managing um, depending on the degree of frailty, if they're quite advanced, it would also focus on appropriate symptom management, so um, end of life uh, care as well. And then we uh, have one of our researchers is actually within the Faculty of Law, um, and so she wants to explore tensions between the continuing care of regulatory. So continuing care is a very tight regulatory environment, and sometimes that actually put, hinders our ability to be innovative in the setting to actually change care practices and ultimately can have an unfortunately a negative impact on our ability to improve quality of life. So she wants to look at this and study this and actually propose uh, ways to actually change, uh, potentially change our regulatory framework to, to be more um, open to innovation while at the same time protecting. So um, lots of uh, areas uh, to explore this, particularly coming out of the pandemic. So these are the the our main priorities and you can see this, but you can see it sort of although we have isolated it down to sort of these three priorities, they actually do interact a, a lot. So there's, there's going to be overlap. So, for example, the therapeutic outdoor spaces overlaps. It's priority one, but also overlapping with priority two in terms of looking at innovation, um, but also changing the environment as well. The injury prevention um, and privacy um, into overlaps between priority one and two. The regulatory work overlaps with all of them. Care delivery pathways overlap. Um, you know, uh, we also have to put front and center uh, infection pre and prevention and control coming out of the pandemic. But you can see sort of how we have a number of projects um, that are going to look um, at improving continuing care in these three priorities and in overlapping ways. So I'm um, just going to sum up and then we can open it up to questions and discussion. Um, coming out of the pandemic, really, we do need reform and urgently need reform. So as I said, by the, by 2031 20 to 2035, our population will um, be about one in four, we'll be over 65 and the increasing need for continuing care. So this is not something we can wait on. We need to move. It is already 2022. So we're proposing innovative approaches to rethinking continuing care that's going to focus on optimizing function health and well-being of older adults, while at the same time optimizing care delivery by a critical and traditionally undervalued workforce. 
And I didn't mention too much, but also part of this project and the idea is to put in um, an application to the CFI, the Canadian um, Innovation uh, Foundation, to get funding to do this project. And also it would allow us to support um, training and capacity building for more and more researchers to work in this space. So we have a pretty diverse team of researchers already in, in um in Calgary that are already working in continuing care or have interest in working in continuing care and ideally they would be supervising grad students and, and healthcare um, providers and really get them interested in working in this in this um, sector and also ideally vitalize it and even encourage people health frontline healthcare workers in this setting and make it more appealing and to actually um, really drive innovation and drive care the sector that has really been traditionally undervalued um, and underfunded. I think that was highlighted during the pandemic is you know, part of the reason that a lot of facilities that particularly early on ended up with outbreaks was because we were under underpaying a lot of people that worked in continuing care, which meant they were working at having to work uh, much more than a 1.0 FTE. They were working across facilities and unfortunately that um, IPNC considerations um, to manage um, potential for spreading spreading the um, COVID virus across multiple facilities. We really do need to, to look at this workforce, valuing them more, doing more to make the work environment better and encouraging others to work in the environment. So really it's about involving sort of the population or the sec this this sector, the continuing care sector, in research and innovation, really in a, in a targeted way that that where we can meet their needs, both th those working and those living in, in this environment. So that's my presentation. I'll open it up to questions, comments. Stay right there. Um, I just wanted to, for a reminder for our online audience, um, is to use the question icon to ask your questions. It is a moderated format, so once your uh, question is published, um, you can upvote the questions if you like, and uh, we'll do our best to select a broad range of, of questions. But first, um, let's take some questions from our in-person audience. Um, so if you have a question, um, please uh, just state your name. Um, our mic should be able to pick you up for our online audience and ask your question. <laughs> I'm George Um Thank you very much. That was uh, incredibly interesting. Uh, it's certainly an area that we have a uh, deep interest in. As I mentioned earlier, we. We have had some engagement with uh, with the topic, and uh, we see great opportunities here uh, for us to both um, contribute to the improvement of the situation and to also involve ourselves commercially in the solutions. So, thank you very much for that. The Duke, I have two questions for you. And the first one is um, uh, just to make sure that I have a Clear understanding of your your efforts right now. I think you mentioned that you're looking to improve the clinical environment, in fact, make it more home-like. Um, there, there's been a great deal of uh, discussion that, that I'm aware of uh, from the other perspective, from adding some clinical capabilities into the into the whole. Uh, so improving the domestic environment to be able to accommodate uh, needs of uh, people as they age. Um, you, um, how, how do you view that uh, that transition? Uh, and how does your work engage with perhaps the? the so I don't think it's an either or. I think it's both. So I think. Um, Definitely, we can use technology um, to do around, like I said, monitoring, um, and, and but it'll always have to supplement human being, right? So, so um, you know, and really, how someone successfully ages is really dictated more by um, the human being resources you have available to you. So, um, in Alberta, actually, we have a very good healthcare system compared to, you know, probably one of the best in, in Canada. Um, actually, do provide a fair bit of care. And can be supplement supplement the um, uh, family caregivers, but it but it's right, if you don't have family caregivers, you don't have relatives that are living in the city or that are available to provide care or financially can, can do that. 
um, that, that's a huge limitation. Or if you don't have resources to purchase or supplement with, you know, what, you, what the government will provide, right? So the limit in Alberta is four hours a day, maximum use of home care. And it's really care that's focused around um, sort of your more personal care. It's not around um, higher level things that, you know, contract is not like shoving your driveway or meals you get delivered or, you know, there is, there is, so there is abilities to sort of continue to support people living at home. And I think we've actually been doing that really well. And why I say that is because we know that those that are going, entering the continuing care, um, sort of facility-based continuing care, are, tend, are, are older and been more frail than they were previously. But eventually, a um, certain percentage of the population, is going, their care needs are going to be too high that they can't be managed at home. So we, you know, just economies of scale and just the ability, just, just the types of care they need, there's, there is no other alternative than in a more of a facility based or that's the focus. I care needs high health care. Um, so I think I think we need, we need both. And um, you know, so so continuing to look at technologies and, and um, supporting family caregivers. Um, you know, there, there's evidence actually that your ability to um, came out of the states that showed years ago that showed uh, keeping you out of a long-term care facility was directly um, proportionate to how many daughters or daughter members you have. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, it's really is about resources and or, you know, so um, so there's always going to be people that don't have those things, right? And, and, and our system can only explain so much. And then also if you add in, you know, cognitive impairments or dementia becomes an issue, right? So somebody maybe isn't safe to, to live on their own. Like they might not need a lot of help, but they need supervision. Right? And supervision and that can be accident. And we're also talking often the caregiver is the elderly spouse. There's limitations there, or what happens when the spouse by themselves, right? So I think I think we need to focus on both. But and, and I think uh, I think generally the general public is more keen on living at home because none of us because I think we we have this image of what it is to live in a continuing care facility that no one wants to go there, but then I'm I just challenge you is well, why have we made continuing care facilities a place where no one's we should actually be making them a place that people think it's not such a bad place to be. It's actually a great place to, you know, quality of life and you know, actually a better life than if I was in I agree extremely strongly on that point. And, and uh, I personally with all the experiences which just mentioned now with my parents. So um, I, I completely understand what you're saying. There is uh, some interesting literature from uh, Scandinavia experiments where they're looking at multi-generational living yep. for uh, the elderly and how beneficial is that can potentially be. Yeah, there's uh, like putting schools so daycares into facilities, yeah, right. or having uh, turning, you know, which I think is interesting too, where they've actually had someone they put dorms, uh, dorms into continuing care, and there's this sort of expectation that or their something like their dorm prices if they actually participate in their continuing to. I think there's lots of things that we haven't really been aggressively exploring yet. Physical requirements for the elderly seem to be very close to, to, to the to the uh, young adult population. So that's very interesting. Uh, the second question that I had uh, was around, and I'm not sure if I understood correctly or didn't, but I think you mentioned. Uh, that your project right now is looking at developing intellectual property and uh, developing um, patents uh, as a result. I'm just curious about your engagement model uh, with respect to IP and patents with uh, partners. Yes, so um, how this project started is it started as an application for to the CFI, which is a uh, Structure in Canada to buy infrastructure for research um, and innovation, and part of the expectation is from that you do, uh, have, you know, patents and visualization. So particularly for theme one around built environment, right? And so, you know, building here is um, fabricate, fabricating buildings. That is the idea if you look at um, patents and visualizing that, right? So they actually could. The industry. That's the industry. Overall, I mean, me personally, and a lot of the researchers traditionally, we haven't, you know, like the idea is particularly when you're getting 
a lot of this research gets funded by public dollars, a lot of it's going to be premium. There's not a lot of just in, in necessarily a lot of IP and commercial. I mean, commercialization for as a, as a means to make sure that it's spread and spans. Commercialization is not could be more. Um, but that doesn't mean you know something is really innovative and some patent you know and patents can also patent can also help protect the integrity of what you design right so you design it in a way that actually it loses all its value right because we designed it and done the world human factors engineer testing on it right patenting it protects make sure you actually let the design is so that's more about it. My not all of my colleagues and researchers may feel the, the same way, but that's sort of how I envision it. It's more a mechanism to actually have, have with what we, you know, once we get the infrastructure in place, we support the research to happen, and then ideally it gets disseminated and spread and actually has broad impact, not beyond, and definitely beyond Cambridge Manor, beyond the surrounding facilities that they have all the way up, you know. To, That makes sense. Thank you. I see some sentiment echo that in development. Um, I, I'm wondering if, if you sort of maybe not a fair question to ask at this point in your research. <laughs> um, if you think about um, Cambridge Manor today and the research that comes out of the work you're doing there, what do you sort of anticipate the experience of somebody walking into the care facility of the future? Is it going to look wildly different or are you anticipating? A lot of smaller changes that don't necessarily be revision how buildings get put together. Yeah, so I mean, initially, this is like this facility. You know, it, it's a beautiful facility and has some innovation, but it like the idea is to is to create a space to actually test new innovation versus it being right. Because as you know, innovation quickly becomes out of the way, right? So the idea is to have the infrastructure that at least for a decade. If we have the infrastructure that we continue building, so it won't necessarily all. It's not like they're going to be able to keep renovating and changing Cambridge Manors up as a whole facility. Although, you know, Brenda Stratford uh, Foundation is building another um, facility uh, in Calgary. And so some of the renovations. What? Cut off the camera. Oh, sorry. It is speak loud. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> so, so yeah, the, the idea is to have the space to actually test the innovation versus that facility being sort of on always on the cutting edge of, of innovation, right? And so, um, I mean, I think that, and so it's, it provides the infrastructure, the space, the real world to test things and in potentially, I mean, definitely, but, you know, the French Stafford Foundation is interested in technology that they can adapt and broadly spread, and they will, but it's to also share uh, beyond so that it can inform. So yes, ideally, you know, these extra 200 beds we're gonna need in Canada are gonna need new facilities. Ideally, we can get, get this done and actually inform those fields so they, it, it does look completely different. And, and what that means, I don't know that it's going to be, you know, high fancy space technology. It's really about when you go in there, do you feel like you walked into somebody's home versus walking into what now often feels like a facility not much different than going into a hospital? I uh, I'm Pat Greenville, so I'm a great transformation team. Uh, I was particularly curious about how do you collect data on the well being of the differ from? Yeah, so there, so part of it, you know, we have to be the strategies around enrolling people with um, with dementia into studies, so with, to the data on capability. So some, often you end up um, getting consent from subject decision makers. Although we always typically, even if we have consent from someone else, we always also consider assent, right? So if someone with dementia at the time showing that they don't want to participate, we don't force them to participate. So that, right, we always got to think from an ethics perspective. So there's that element. And then there are tools and scales that have been specifically developed for um, to, to study well being and to study other, you know, pain and other things in, in people with cognitive impairment. So, you know, just different tools and and part of the, this work could be actually expanding that to developing ways to actually evaluate things like well-being and that. And so it's taking kind of some of the tools and resources that are out there, but could actually also develop. 
we have a few questions from online. Um, so if I may, um, but one question here is, is there some involvement of the Department of Occupational Therapy or occupational therapists who work with universal design, the geriatric uh, population and basic instrumental activities of daily living on a day to day basis. So the University of Calgary actually doesn't have um, a faculty of um, building patients, so it doesn't it does we don't train physiotherapists, occupational therapists, they, they're actually at U of A. So no, that's not one of the faculty because we just don't have that. Faculty. But that being said, there's a lot of occupational and physiotherapists that work in the uh, Seniors Health in, in our zone and within the Department of Medicine. So, so not so much on this project team, but yes, they, they stay very involved day to day and occupational therapists and occupational therapists at, at the facility. But, but that that would be a missing faculty because we just don't have that. Faculty. Thank you. Um, another question we have, um, Michael Hayward. Can you describe some of the specific mechanical, like doors or thresholds, technological, like TVs and computers, or social barriers, interactions with staff and residents that you would say are the biggest issues that drove you to design the study? So th this is a team, right? <laughs> so I and I'm not. There are engineers and there are tech. So you know, my, my answer to this it might be different than theirs, but I think. Um, I just knowing working with older adults and I mean, I think that so we do know that the older population is actually quick to is sort of the growing use of technology, particularly coming under the pandemic, right? So we don't we should never make assumptions. Like often people say, oh, the older population doesn't want to use technology. That's actually a false statement. So they very much engage with technology and are very much sort of rapidly using technology. So I think that we should be considering technology and the use of technology, but we need to make sure we're always doing factors and usability testing because you know as we get older we can have uh, issues with improving vision and even with um, other sensory so the so the use of technology that for age related and disease related um, changes as we age which it, which it doesn't always right so and also um, you know we're doing some testing in condo that they purchased around some day to day off the shelf um, technology with an older adult and you know, the more apps you have to open up or the more um, disconnected the technology is, the harder it is to use, um, right? And, and just the learning, if the technology doesn't work well, that, that I mean, I think it's frustration for all of us, right? About using it. Um, so I, th I think actually what we learned in some of this usability testing in this population will actually help us. Um, but those are sort of some of the barriers I would say is, is right, if it doesn't, it limited ability to troubleshoot and, and they don't always interact, they don't always have quite the, they may or may not have quite the impact that you think, which is why we need to test it. I mean, it's just part of the question. <laughs> um, you mentioned doing A B testing. Yeah. And I guess that was on the architecture design. Yeah. How how does that work? Like is there a null case as well that's considered? So what what we're proposing to do is to take four um, resident rooms and demolish them and turn them into two. And so that gives us enough space sort of to do, to move walls and to move structures around. And actually um, what we would do is you'd have residents living for short periods of time in those two spaces. And so you could you could test two alternatives to the same structure. Like maybe it's, you know, the bathroom, how the bathroom is configured or, you know, the doors or the walls or what's on the walls or the, you know, sort of the design elements. And so, so that's the idea is you could test um, sort of similar, but Slightly different um, concepts and two two different residents living in them and do actual um, you know uh, survey data and interview qualitative quantitative data and actually the usability of it and, and how and it's it's really this is about pilot testing though right initial just to test the concept how usable is it which was more which was preferred what kind of you know, actually we took, they could do real time modifications to some of it and then the concept would be then you'd ideally. In a perfect world, we'd be able to test it broadly to, to properly evaluate it. Although realistically, that may be challenging, right? On, but, but it's still better than what currently happens. But from my understanding of talking to, to John Brown, is what currently happens now is we kind of it's all most architectures rule of thumb and, and based on real time design and development and are in the pressures of a project, right? Where you have time limits and budget limits. Mm -hmm. 
So things may or may not be possible that you initially thought, and you don't actually don't have to have the opportunity to do that. So these are really testing and modifying and customize it as you go. So so this is still better than what we currently do, even though it, it's still got some limitations. At least it does give us an environment to actually test and modify and do some real sort of human factors kind of as a testing. Do not consider that every architectural project is going to be different just based on time constraints and location. Not revised. <laughs> you showed yeah a Venn diagram. You showed like your three priorities. I guess I'm wondering like is the uh, is there a lot to keep in competition with those priorities or is it pretty like do you have a pretty good um, a lot of confidence that those were they should be pursuing or other competing ideas out there. Uh, we learned how we came to. Well, I think we realized that we wanted to that we needed to look at the the physical environment, right? So the indoor and outdoor environment, and then we also wanted to embrace technology. And people were doing things at the university around technology, and could we take that technology um, into the setting? And then, you know, we you couldn't, you know, we need we need the people at the forefront of HR and kind of care. And it's a still care environment, right? But you have people that are working and caring for people. That so I think, and it and it was it was sort of that idea that it it kind of had to overlap those three things under the technology and and how they all interact. And then it, some of it was being was driven by researchers at the university and what they were interested in, what they were doing, and how could they interact. So what we did do that was unique though was we brought people together that didn't actually haven't been bringing people together that hadn't worked with people to work together, getting them to work together, or or they've been doing stuff in other contexts. Research and, and concepts in this. Context. So it was, a, it was a little bit of that kind of bigger planning around those three areas. And then what projects we chose and then forward was a bit uh, based on interest and expertise. And, and, and it's a little bit arbitrary too, right? Because some of the projects that might sit in theme two could easily sit in theme one, vice versa, or even three, two and three. But when you write a, when you write a proposal, you have to. Themed it, but we wanted to show that it's actually, even though we have things and themes, that there there isn't that it's not sort of pillared. It's really and actually showing the true interaction between the people. It's a bit, it's a bit organic and a bit um, a bit intentional too, though. How can we make sure that we actually have, have truly have those three things matching in that? One more question from online, and um, you have touched on it uh, and, and some of your responses, but what's the plan to expand the project to other branches of continuing care, such as home care? At this point, um, no no specific plans um, into the community outside of, um, so we have the independent living facility that's right beside that's attached, and so we do, some of the projects actually will be looking to recruit Individual living and independent living, and some of them, particularly the outdoor. So the outdoor spaces we're going to have will be the sort of surrounding um, Cambridge Manor that will be accessible to broader community communities for those projects. Um, but but this particular, the focus of this particular project was to look at continuing care facility living. So that's really you know sort of the, the theme of it. Now the Brenda Stratford Center on Aging itself is looking at the broader community. So looking at um, aging in place, and we're working with Calgary. Um, you know, City of Calgary is looking at, at um, age family communities, so the Brenda Stratford Center is involved with that. One aspect, uh, Brenda Stratford has also looked at dementia friendly communities in terms of how you educate the public around um, interacting with people challenging with home and so, so there is broader projects, but this one in particular is the focus. There was some reached out to. It's kind of the have to find the right balance of focusing, but there's a, there's a lot of um, other centers on aging that are looking at aging in place and technology. And we also want it to be unique in terms of what does this project uniquely bring to Canada? So the unique aspects was being in a real facility, real continuing care, oper operating continuing care facility, looking at the, the physical environment. Um, that's what it's Um, an excellent presentation that you made. 
and also been a part of you know watching these experiences with my father who suffered with dementia. So a lot of it is so so true for me. I'm wondering you mentioned that there's a percentage of the population, a younger percentage, who also suffers with frailties. Do you see research also benefiting them uh, as you continue along, particularly in the reading combinations and such? So typically, sort of when we do make things accessible or when we make things age friendly, that it actually makes it age, it makes it friendly for everybody. It may be even people that aren't living with disabilities. So when we make age friendly communities that maybe are more accessible to people that have walkers or you know other other types of animal devices, it also makes it more friendly for women that are pushing baby carriages, right? Mm -hmm. So right, so that so a lot of like I, I can't think of any example of a technology that made something. Better for somebody that was living with, you know, say a mobility issue that then made it harder for someone that wasn't, right? Yeah. And so, and that's actually why often we talk about age friendly communities versus not sort of particularly labeling them as any one age, right? They make it sound like all of us. So, um, you know, it, it, I think anything we do that makes things better for one, makes things more accessible, makes it more accessible for all, all age categories. In terms of frailty, so, what we do know about frail, so any, anywhere in the lifespan you can be frail, because I said it's increased, um, in, your higher risk of adverse outcomes compared to other, others of your same age, right? So even some children are potentially living with compared to other children. But what we do know about frailty is if you become frail or, you know, in early adulthood, you're more likely to have reversibility of that frailty. So often it's because you're dealing with one issue that maybe with treatment or rehabilitation, it's reversible. Um, whereas as we age, we tend to accumulate more and more um, diseases as we age um, and associated disabilities. And so the reversibility of frailty as we age becomes less. Um, and so which is why we see more frailty in, in the older population, less reversible, living with more chronic diseases, complex diseases. Um, you know, so, so and, and cognitive um, impairment becomes more and more prevalent as well. So there, there's still some unique aspects to frailty in older adults that from, from younger population, although it's still a better predictor looking at frailty and someone's frailty is a better predictor of uh, their outcomes to the interventions and to, you know, health interventions or other interventions and age itself. Because I don't know if you remember, I said at 85, 50% of the population is living with frailty. That also means that half the population is living relatively robustly or with very limited frailty, which means they actually could, it should be living in the community. They probably are interacting very limited with the healthcare system, right? And so if we Make decisions based on age. We're actually going to be discriminating against um, part of a huge part of our population, right? That doesn't actually. So we're better to target based on someone's degree of frailty. Um, what we offer. Yeah, it's a better predictor of healthcare um, user utilization and, and, and life expectancy frailty. You can have somebody that's in their 60s that's quite frail yes. end of life, and then you could have somebody that's in their 90s that actually could live another decade. Yeah, it's true. So. Well, thank you. Uh, that concludes our session for today. Um, thank you so much uh, for uh, Dr. Holard Ledig for your remarks and answering all of our questions. Um, and thank you to all of the ACO colleagues who have joined us in person and online. And a special thanks to, to my colleagues who put this event together. Um, you did an amazing job and we appreciate all your efforts. To everyone who has joined us today, um, we appreciate your interest in our speaker series and we remind you to check out our YouTube channel to see um, past, um, to past speaker series sessions. A reminder that this is our fourth session, but it's one of many, and our next session is, is scheduled for next week, November 7th, with a presentation from Dr. Misha Kirchhoff from the University of Arizona. But in the meantime, uh, please stay safe and thank you so much for joining us.